There's a term that's been tossed around for the past decade or so, carbon offshoring, sometimes more broadly referred to as emissions offshoring, since carbon dioxide is not the only prominent greenhouse gas being churned into the atmosphere en masse. And the emergence and popularity of this term has made it easier to discuss another concept that has complexified the issue of decarbonizing the planet, that of carbon havens. Traditionally, when measuring a nation's CO2 or other emissions footprint, we look at the level of CO2 or methane or whatever else emitted within the borders of that nation. So the U.S.'s CO2 emissions have typically been measured by taking stock of how much carbon dioxide is emitted within the borders of the United States, based on records kept by coal power plants, by manufacturing statistics, and in some cases more directly using trackers or satellites or other data collection technologies. The same is true if we want to gauge the methane emissions of Vietnam, the nitrogen dioxide emissions of the Netherlands, and so on. These measurements are imperfect, but they've generally been used because they're the best estimates we have, combining what we know to be true with what we believe to be true, and then adjusting a bit based on what we suspect we're not able to measure, but which is still relevant to the data and the decisions we will need to make based on that data. The trouble with this approach to measuring emissions, which are often called statistically derived production and manufacturing related emissions, or something along those lines, is that in the interconnected world we live in, where globalization is on the decline due to conflicts between the US and China and Russia and the EU and other foundational economies, but is still for the time being, and probably for at least another decade or two, the default economic organizational model. Within that context, it's possible to keep the low emissions production and manufacturing activities within one's own borders and to then export the more polluting and emitting stuff to other countries. The archetypical example of this from the mid-Cold War till the 20-teens was that of the United States moving a whole lot of its industrial and manufacturing capacity to Asia, primarily but not exclusively to China, where these activities were concentrated in industrial areas, where the world's most carbon-intensive and otherwise emitting activities have been centralized. This is part of what allowed China to grow wealthier so relatively quickly, but it came with a lot of downsides, including an ever-expanding carbon and other emission and pollutant footprint. Businesses in the United States kept a lot of the low emissions stuff in country then, but continued to benefit from the overseas-based highly emitting effort, either owning the assets that were used in this way, completely or partially, or making deals with companies located in these far-flung locales that locked in relationships so they were similar to ownership, giving them most of the benefits of running highly emitting endeavors themselves, but without the regulatory and perceptual downsides. This has allowed entities like Apple to pick one of countless companies that have enthusiastically engaged in this kind of offshoring activity to keep the higher paid design and development and management work in the United States while shuffling the dirtier and more manual labor intensive stuff to China and increasingly other nations like Vietnam as well. There's nothing inherently wrong with this kind of setup, and there are many benefits to this type of specialized globalization. Benefits for the sticker prices of products, but also for the slow expansion of knowledge and infrastructure, as long as those on the manual labor side of the equation are eventually able to benefit from those assets and that know-how above and beyond the paychecks they earn for doing that labor, working their way up the value ladder over time. But it can distort the numbers when we're trying to ascertain what sort of emissions are being produced where, as these carbon havens, places that are happy to pick up highly emitting work from other countries, moving it to their territory with all the pros and cons that entails, these smaller countries seem to have much higher emissions than would be justified by their income and overall human flourishing levels, while countries like the United States and the countries in the European Union and other wealthy governments are able to point at charts that show that their emissions are moving steadily downward. And there is some truth to that downward movement objectively, but not as much as some of the figures suggest, because in some cases, those emissions are being moved 
not eliminated. And that movement changes how we tabulate and categorize those emissions. But the end benefactor still tends to be the companies and consumers in wealthier nations at the expense of everyone else. It's an accounting trick, not a sustainability-oriented innovation. What I'd like to talk about today is a new regulatory approach being deployed by the EU and how it might impact these sorts of relationships and measurement models moving forward. You're listening to Let's Know Things. I'm Colin Wright. Let's Know Things is an independent, listener-supported show. If you're enjoying what I'm doing here, please consider becoming a financial supporter of the show. The simplest way to do that is to become a patron at patreon.com slash letsknowthings, or you can become a member at understandery.com to support this and all of my projects. Folks who become supporters gain access to an additional episode of the show each month and an ad-free version of the show. A great big thanks to everybody who's already helping to support Let's Know Things. You're the reason I'm able to make this show each week, and for that I am truly grateful. All right, let's get back to the show. The concept of carbon leakage which is another way of referring to that aforementioned tendency to shift carbon-intensive work from one country to another, allowing emissions to leak across borders and changing how we measure them as a consequence, has been on the European Commission's radar for a while now. It's been making plans to address this issue for over a decade. And in the years since those discussions began, there's been a shift in how most international organizations track emissions. The method I mentioned in the intro, that of tracking production and manufacturing numbers, is still used by many organizations and interests, especially those connected to industries that emit a lot, like those in the energy world, the concrete and steel manufacturing world, the agricultural world, and the world of construction. All industries that, in aggregate, emit the lion's share of CO2 and methane, and all industries that consequently would very much like to tweak the numbers being used to shape the public and regulatory discussion about this problem, to make it look like their contributions are dropping faster than they are, and that's often accomplished by moving their higher emission activities from one location to another. Increasingly common, though, is measuring what's called consumption-based emissions. These measurements are also estimates, but they take into consideration the emissions necessary to produce the goods and services consumed by a country, not just those produced within their borders. So the U.S. produces some amount of emissions in country, but consumes goods and services that produce emissions tallied in other countries, like China and Vietnam as well. And this method of tracking those emissions takes those into consideration, making it, in most cases, a more objective measure. That sort of recalibration places a lot more emissions on the U.S.'s docket, but it also removes some because the U.S. produces goods and services that are used in other countries, too. So this doesn't just inflate numbers universally, it rearranges them to account for who is producing what for whom, and that tweaks the final figures a bit, reducing the emissions produced in manufacturing and raw materials generating countries like China, India, and across parts of Central and Southeastern Asia, since they export a lot more than they consume, at least in terms of emissions generating goods and services, and it simultaneously increases the emissions attributed to wealthier nations like the U.S. and those in the European Union. But the increase in the U.S. is not a lot, something like 7%. And though the EU has a bigger gap between their production and consumption emissions, about 18%, the overall global gap here isn't as massive as you might suspect which implies the value added compared to consumption taking place is relatively balanced. It's not perfect because, as I just mentioned, the EU is consuming about 18% more emissions-related value than it produces, and the U.S. is consuming about 7% more. But many countries, like China, have near-match figures between these two tabulation methods, which implies that the emissions leakage and carbon offshoring that were considered to be big threats several years ago have not exploded into the big issues we worried they would become in earlier years, which simplifies things a bit in terms of tracking and figuring out which issues we should try to tackle all of which is relevant to a series of moves being made in the EU 
oriented around the bloc's desire to reduce its emissions to zero as quickly as possible, but to ideally not collapse its economy in the process. This is a tricky balance to strike because tweaking incentives to reduce emissions usually means applying economic pressure on business entities operating within your legal framework, which in practice means raising costs, at least in the short term, for EU-based businesses that emit and removing those costs for those who emit less over time. This approach is fine and good for the purpose of internalizing external costs, like emitting CO2 into the atmosphere, which traditionally has not had additional economic costs associated with it, and was thus generally ignored by businesses that keep their eyes on the bottom line, on money, at times to the exclusion of all other concerns. But as you make it more expensive for your local businesses to emit CO2 and other gases in a globalized world like the one we live in, that approach makes the products and services offered by international businesses, those not regulated by the EU Commission, more appealing in some ways. Because those businesses can emit as much as they want without those additional costs. And that means their offerings will tend to be cheaper for essentially the same thing because those emissions, fines, and taxes do not apply to them. So that means a ton of steel produced in China and a ton of steel produced in Germany might be exactly the same product, but cost substantially more if you buy it from Germany, because German producers will be investing in lower carbon methods of producing steel, which raises costs for them in the short term, and they'll also be paying fees for the emissions they produce in the meantime until they are able to substantially reduce those emissions. Chinese steel will thus be cheaper for a while, and that might put German steelmakers out of business before they can become as sustainable as they want to be. One way to ameliorate this potentiality is to figure out how to internalize those externalities for non-EU steelmakers and other businesses as well. And the approach the European Union seems to have opted for is the utilization of what's called carbon border adjustment mechanisms, often acronymed as CBAMs. The EU's proposed CBAMs are a bit complicated and wonky in their specifics, but the general aim is to apply as many of their own EU-specific emissions-reducing policies to goods and services imported from elsewhere, as is legally possible. And they intend to accomplish this by slapping fees on stuff imported into the European Union, so that steel brought in from China would, in theory at least, have additional fees applied to it, which would bring its price tag more into line with that of Germany's offerings. In the long term, the idea is to push companies in the EU and elsewhere to reduce their emissions, as economically that becomes the financially smart thing to do. If you're trying to do business with one of the biggest economic regions on the planet, it makes smart monetary sense to reduce your emissions because that means lower fees, which over time makes you more competitive because you can keep your prices low. CBAMs have been discussed by many governments for years, but the EU, if its collection of these policies are fully implemented as currently proposed, would be the first to enact this type of policy, and it would make their internal emissions trading system, which their CBAMs would synchronize with, a lot more sophisticated and expansive, which would also, in theory at least, make their block more appealing to carbon drawdown and other sustainability-oriented companies, because such companies could profit from basically racking up negative emissions, pulling CO2 from the air, and then selling those credits to companies that are reducing their emissions more slowly. That latter point is part of why this collection of policies have taken on heightened importance in the EU over the past few years, as the United States Infrastructure and Inflation Reduction Acts have funneled tons of money into sustainability-related businesses while also making it very financially appealing for such businesses, from EV companies to solar panel manufacturers to battery installers, to move their operations or build new operations in the United States. The EU does not want to be left behind on this, losing out on the burgeoning green gold rush to the United States. So they're trying to figure out ways to incentivize these companies and their investors to look toward Europe instead of North America, and this collection of policies could help them do that. Speaking of the United States, the Biden administration has been tossing around the idea of doing something similar, using CBAMs to incentivize relevant interests to move to the states, while also using their economic heft and appeal to nudge foreign interests into reducing their emissions.
it would reportedly be a bit trickier for the U.S. to implement these sorts of policies right now, lacking a federal carbon price upon which to base the fees incurred by companies that emit as they produce, which is something the EU already has in place. But it's not impossible, and it could speed up the development of that kind of carbon payment system stateside as well. We'll see, though. The political situation in the U.S. might not allow for this kind of shift at the moment or ever. Stepping away from the big picture to refocus on the current EU plan, on a practical level, this plan is scheduled to go into effect on a transitional basis from late 2023 through 2025, a period during which emissions reporting systems would be implemented by importers of relevant goods, which would help set the stage for applying fees based on those tallied emissions beginning in 2026. Some EU entities would enjoy free emissions allowances until that moment, but those allowances would be phased out with the phase-in of fees for foreign entities. And that timing is meant to keep things competitive by avoiding any favor for EU businesses once these regulations are fully in place. These CBAMs would initially apply to highly emitting sectors only, like those that produce cement, aluminum, fertilizers, iron and steel, and electricity. Over time, the EU could increase the scope of industries to which these policies apply, and it would reduce the number of emissions certificates available, so businesses can pay to emit more. But over time, the total volume of emissions that are allowed will go down, which in theory at least should lower the ceiling of all emissions related to EU-consumed products and services globally. Folks within the EU have also pitched the idea of eventually applying the same collection of incentives to other aspects of manufacturing and business, like human rights and recyclable packaging, things like that, not just carbon emissions, stuff that they would like to change across their supply chains, but which they cannot legislate away because other governments control these aspects of the businesses they regulate. The EU has a history of figuring out ways to spread its own regulations, like the General Data Protection Regulation, or GDPR, to other countries. As anyone who wants to do business with the EU, which most businesses do if they can, have to abide by these rules. And adhering to them broadly, rather than in a focused way, tends to make better business sense for most product types. So these rules that start out as rules for the EU become the rules of the land for most major economies globally. Whether these CBAMs will work the same way and whether the incentives they leverage will be appealing broadly enough and on the necessary scale is anyone's guess. But they could, possibly even in the short term, nudge other countries to deploy similar regulations while also providing a framework for larger multinational and multi-block agreements alongside the changes that they will catalyze in the EU in the coming years. <music> If you're enjoying Let's Know Things, consider becoming a supporter. The simplest way to do that is to become a patron at patreon.com slash let's know things or a member at understandery.com. And folks who support this show via either of those options gain access to an additional episode of the show each month and an ad-free version of the show. A great big thanks to everyone who's already helping to support Let's Know Things and thank you in advance if you're considering doing so in the future. The book I'd like to recommend today is called Pests, How Humans Create Animal Villains by Bethany Brookshire. This book is very focused in its topic. It discusses things that we consider to be pests, the nature of those various creatures, and why we consider them to be pests, and what it means to be a pest, and what happens practically once something is delineated as such. And the big thesis takeaway here is contained in the title, that we create the concept of what it is to be a pest, and thus anything could be put into this category, which then allows us to treat these things in different ways than we would treat much beloved animals and plants. And that unto itself is worth the price of admission for this book, but it's also very informative across the board about different things that we consider to be pests and how that label is applied and why it's applied for different sorts of creatures over time. Now, if any of that sounds interesting to you, consider picking up a copy of Pests by Bethany Brookshire. <laughs>
You can find out more about me and my work at colin.io. You can find the show notes and transcript for this and every episode of the podcast at letsknowthings.com. You can find my other news-focused podcast, One Sentence News, wherever you get your podcasts or at onesentencenews.com. And feel free to reach out and say howdy on social media. I'm Colin Wright on Facebook and YouTube and at Colin is my name on Instagram and Twitter. Thank you so very much for listening. I'm Colin Wright, and I'll talk to you again next week. Thank you.